Uh, let me pray for us. Okay. Father, thank you so much for a chance to be able to gather with, uh, uh, with this family. Um, thank you for uh, our guests that are here this morning. And thank you for those who, who might not yet be in this family as they don't know you, but uh, you are pursuing them. And we thank you that today is the day that they are responding to your pursuit and seeking more of you. Lord, I would ask that you would work through my inadequacies as always. Um, have mercy in the congregation due to my lack of uh, ability to do this on my own. And I would ask that you would speak powerfully and boldly, uh, that you would make your word come across with clarity, uh, that your word would be great, that your presence would be known, and that your uh, name would be magnified through this message. Uh, Father, thank you so much for the privilege and the opportunity to be able to sit under your word and to preach your word this morning. Uh, we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, hey, guys. Good morning. I'm Pastor Kevin. And we are in, if you can believe it, we are in our, in our last week of this wonderfully long impromptu series called The Lord's Prayer. Uh, this is the last week. There's no more surprises. I'm not going to be like, hey, listen, I found something else. This, we're done. Um, and next week we will be uh, doing a little one-off, and then we'll get into our new series and we'll be back in a new book of the Bible, uh, the book of James. And I'm excited to walk through that book with you. It will not take five years like the book of Acts did for those who were with me when I was hired as a, as a speaker um, down the road. Uh, that, was, that was quite the long series, but um, God used the book of Acts to break me, to build me, to grow me. And I hope he did the same for you. Uh, now we're going to get to walk into the book of James together, and I'm excited for that. Uh, but until then, we are in the book of Matthew. So if you've got your Bibles or your apps, go ahead and open them up. We're in Matthew's Gospel, and we're in chapter 6. We've been reading starting with verse 5, and we've been going all the way through verse 13. The bulk of the prayer is in verse 9 through 13. So that's where we're at this morning. If you have your Bibles or your apps, go ahead. You can read along. Otherwise, uh, up here on the screen. It says, pray then like this. So I'm going to start with just the bulk of the prayer, not 5, 6, 7, and 8, starting with verse 9. This is Jesus speaking, and he's speaking to the 12. Somebody might say, hey, but this is the Sermon on the Mount. There was a lot of people present. Absolutely. When Jesus did anything, crowds followed him, crowds gathered. But his address, his speaking, was solely to the 12. Okay? This was not a prayer that the masses were being taught. Because this is a prayer only the believer can pray. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is not a prayer for the unbeliever. And you'll actually even see that today when we talk about protection, all right? But it's pretty obvious that this is a prayer given to the believer to pray to God. It's not necessarily the Lord's Prayer. We call it that simply because the little type at the front of your Bible maybe <laughs> says that. And you're like, well, that must have been written by Jesus. No, no, no. Uh, this is actually the disciples' prayer. It's not the Lord's Prayer. Jesus himself, the Lord, could not have prayed this prayer. It would have been uh, nonsensical, I like that word, nonsensical for Christ to pray this. Because part of this prayer is, as we looked at uh, the fifth component of prayer, confession. Jesus has nothing to confess except for, hey, I'm perfect. That's my confession. And you're not. So, like, there's, it, it's just not something he could have prayed. This was to be prayed by sinners who, who have been saved by grace through faith in Christ. Okay? Okay. Um, Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That is our scripture, that is the disciples' prayer being taught to the disciples by their Lord, and this is a model for prayer, not a manuscript. I've said that all series long. This is a model, not a manuscript. We don't preach it like a manuscript. We don't teach it like a manuscript. And we certainly should not be reciting this as if it was a manuscript. Standing up and saying, all right, everybody, now let's say this together. Our Father who art in heaven. Like, no. All right? This is a model. And in this model, we saw that there were six components of prayer, starting with recognition as our Father, adoration, Hallowed be your name, submission, your kingdom come, your will be done. We submit to that. Supplication, that is asking, give us this day our daily bread. Confession, forgive us daily of our debts as we forgive our debtors. Two-part series there, two-part message there. And now we move into protection, which we find in verse 13. 
Okay, so this week we are looking at the last verse of prayer and the last component of the prayer, which is the need for us to pray for protection from temptation and protection from the evil one. So if you have your Bibles or your apps open, go ahead and highlight in your phone or underline verse 13. That's where we're at this morning. Uh, it reads, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, uh, maybe you've already figured this out, but this is... I would say the most confusing verse in the entire prayer, okay? And I would say this is one of the most difficult to interpret, one of the most confusing, possibly to some people contradictory verses in the entire New Testament, all right? So we're really venturing into some, some difficult waters this morning in, in, our, in our sermon. So as we look at this verse this morning, I want to spend our time together breaking down verse 13, this very difficult verse, uh, into four sections. And I want to explain each one of these sections. I want to show you, one, I want to show you pieces within this verse that you might have already missed, okay? Um, as well as clarify any of the difficulties or perceived difficulties in the text. And my hope in doing this this morning is that you're all going to leave with a proper understanding of um, how God leads, how God delivers, and how God protects his people uh, through the beautiful act of submissive prayer. Okay, does that make sense? Are you guys with me? Up and down, north and south, Sophie? Yeah? Uh, I was uh, yelled at yesterday, um, or I shouldn't say yelled, I can't lie. I was strongly admonished by a young lady of our congregation who said that she hates it when I say north and south because this is not north and south, this is north and south. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to stop me. It just makes me want to say it even more. So with that said, as long as you guys are good with that, shake your head north and south, up and down, and we're going to get going. Verse 13, and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. All right. So four different sections, four different ways. I want to break this down. I want to look at it in four different components. So I shouldn't say but sections. You can break down in four sections. The first section is, and lead us not. So um, you can go ahead and just put a line and lead us not. Put a line there because that's going to be section one. You can just kind of look at the verse in these four different um, sections. And this one, uh, it starts out with Jesus being extremely, or I would say he's just very intentional with the <laughs> language he used when he is teaching this particular part of the model, this, this, this protection component. Um, if you notice, he begins the supplication. That's what this is. It's a supplication. It's a petition. It's, it's an asking. It's a request, right? Uh, and he, he begins this by saying, give us, right? Then he moves into the confession by saying, forgive us, right? He says, give us this day. He begins the, the supplication by saying, give us this day of daily bread. Then he goes on to say, forgive us our debts. So we have give us, then we have forgive us, and then he closes with the protection by saying, lead us. So we can see he's very intentional with, with each one of these words. And each one of these words, give us, forgive us, lead us, they're all requests for direct action from God on our behalf. And it's very important that you grasp the strong wording that Jesus uses here um, because the rest of the verse flows from and gets its meaning from these two words, lead us, okay? So it's very important that we grasp this. Now, if you go back and look at the most ancient, reliable um, Greek manuscripts of Matthew's gospel, you're going to see that all of them record verse 13 beginning with the same Greek word, uh, which is as ferro, as ferro. That's the, 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 every single good, reliable ancient manuscript starts this verse with those uh, with that particular word. And that word means to carry inward, literally, or to carry inward figuratively. Um, it also means to bring into or to lead into. So the word itself, the original um, language used when Matthew recorded this, is a very strong direct word, and it describes deliberate or intentional action on the part of someone. Does that make sense? Right? Okay, so in this sense, it's referring to the father not bringing or the father not leading the subject of this verse, which is, which is us, into temptation. Can you grasp that? Okay? So it's very clear that the way this was originally written is it's referring to the father not bringing or the father not leading, because remember, uh, do not lead us or lead us not, right? Uh, it is a deliberate, intentional bringing or leading into, okay? Or in this case, 
a not bringing or a not leading. Now, in an attempt to soften uh, the implications of this passage and to, um, in an attempt to eliminate any, I would say, perceived difficulties, because it's not really a real difficulty, it's perceived, uh, that come from a misunderstanding of the text, people have tried to say this word, lead us, that we've translated lead us, um, as ferro, uh, is better understood as don't allow us to fall into temptation or keep us from temptation. And I've seen a lot of different people try to retranslate it that way. Even certain translations of, of your scripture will do that. And the problem is the wording of the original text does not allow someone to interpret it that way. Okay, uh, We can't simply soften strong words in the Bible with strong meanings uh, to fit what makes us comfortable. Or we, we, we're not allowed to change meanings to get around perceived difficulties in the text. We just can't do that. Okay. Um, so what's happening right here is right out of the gate, Jesus is telling us to appeal to the Father as the one who must lead us through this minefield of temptation, all right? Um, essentially, we're appealing to the Father to shepherd us. That's really what this is, okay? Um, sheep are unruly, right? Sheep are uh, stubborn. Uh, they're prone to wander. And not only that, but uh, sheep are, honest, it's, it's, they're the definition of prey, amen? Okay? Like... Um, a sheep has no natural defenses. Uh, a sheep has no ability to fight off an attack uh, or another creature. Um, I personally have never yelled the word sheep with terror in my heart. I have yelled the word sheep, but it was with great excitement in my heart to pet one at the petting zoo or to snuggle one. All right? There's a huge difference from the way that I react when I see a sheep. All right? Um, so this is not an animal that navigates the wilderness on its own very well, right? So without a watchful shepherd caring for said sheep, it becomes a lamb chop dinner for a pack of hungry wolves, okay? Um, and no matter how much a sheep wants to muster up its own willpower, it cannot in any way, shape, or form find the intestinal fortitude or strength to become the top of the food chain. It's just not. It's lunch, always and every time. Okay, um, and that's the same with us. Okay, uh, we're exposed, we're overexposed to temptation around us, especially today. Uh, we're living in one of the most um, overexposed generations in the history of creation. The sins that we face today are not new sins. We are just simply more exposed to said sins than anyone else in human history, due to all the advancements that we have that allow us to connect whenever we want with anything. Okay. Um, and with that said, we're very ill-equipped like sheep to navigate the temptations that come from the world around us, and we're absolutely helpless like the sheep to be able to resist them on our own. Now, I would say, sure, if you're thinking in your heart, like, you know what, I'm actually not too bad, Pastor Kevin. Like, I've never fallen into a drug or alcohol addiction. I'm actually not as bad as that person next to me or somebody that I know. Well, congratulations. I'm glad you've not become an opiate addict, but you might have fallen into a uh, um, gluttony, you might have fallen into the sin of pride, anger, gossip, slander, or greed, um, or selfishness, okay? So just because you have not failed miserably with lust doesn't mean that you haven't failed miserably with, uh, um, with bitterness in your heart, okay? So the reality is the minefield of temptation that's out there has a 100% mortality rate on all of humanity, and no amount of willpower or trying harder is going to get any of you through it, amen? Just accept that. Okay? We're sheep. And that's the tone that Jesus sets from the beginning. He recognizes this. He recognizes we are like sheep. We are needing to be shepherd. And using this word lead us as Pharaoh, he is telling us that we need to be shepherded. We need to come with a, a, in, in a state of dependency and attitude of submission to the Father's leaning. And lead us not into temptation. So the prayer starts with an act of total dependency and submission, recognize that we are completely unable, totally unable, um, have zero ability to, to help ourselves, to work our way through life, through this minefield, without getting completely and totally obliterated. Okay? And this is a prayer that can only be prayed by the Christian. Like I said before, this is a disciple's prayer. The unbeliever cannot pray this. So if this is you today, if you have not responded to God's gift of, uh, of, of faith, um, if you have not responded to his gift of grace, I should say, this is not a prayer for you because this is a prayer that recognizes the helplessness 
and the hopelessness of one's own efforts and the need to be led by a God who controls all things. And that is something that only the Christian recognizes. Okay? See what I'm saying? If you're an unbeliever, you have not, you have not accepted that truth yet. And if you are saying, well, I've accepted that truth, then I would say we need to talk then. <laughs> because that is, that is a, the gift of faith is an, is an act whereby which God will save us. Okay? So the best way to sum up is to say this is a prayer of someone um, who trusts God and does not trust themselves. Right? Again, this is a prayer for the believer. Someone who trusts, them, who trusts God and absolutely distrusts themselves. And, and that's completely me as I look at my life um, prior to knowing Christ. And I look at my life after God had saved me. And I see all of the crazy, stupid stuff that I have fallen into in my life because I have tried to go about it on my own. And uh, I am completely enabled. So we enter into the sixth component of the Lord's Prayer and we are asking God in this particular section to protect us through leading us, okay, as we submit to him. Does that make sense? Let me say it again. In here, we are asking God to protect us, okay, through his leading of us by our submission to him, okay? This is how it begins. This is how it starts. And it sets a beautiful tone for the rest of this passage. So let's move into uh, our largest, most difficult portion, and that is uh, into temptation. We're going to spend most of our time here this morning. Um, this is pretty straightforward when you read it, but this is where the difficulty begins, all right? See, if we are told to pray to the Father to not lead us into temptation, does that not imply that God might otherwise lead us into it? and therefore be the one tempting us. Can you see how you could figure that out? And this is why there is so much difficulty in interpreting this passage, and this is why this causes so much confusion as one of the most uh, confusing, to some perceivingly contradictory passage in the whole New Testament. Okay? Um, if we're told to pray for the Father to not lead us into temptation... Could it not imply that God might otherwise lead us into it, therefore making God be the one who tempts us? And the way this sentence is structured has caused uh, countless struggles, countless confusions from the pulpit, uh, in commentaries, um, in personal studies, and I would say this is going back for centuries, all right? People read this and they immediately struggle with how it seems to imply that God tempts people. And that's a struggle for a lot of us because when I said that, I see some of you guys going, no, 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 not at all. I get that. But this is why it's a struggle because we know that this can't be true. We know that that statement is absolutely ridiculous. Like everything we know from Scripture about the character and nature of God tells us he cannot tempt us. Yet we read this and we know this is Jesus' words and we go, well, this is sure does seem like how it sounds, okay? Um, let me give you an example of how we know that this can't be true. James uh, chapter 1, verse 13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Okay? It's pretty straightforward. All right? um, James makes it clear that God can't tempt anyone. Uh, it's simply not part of his nature. But then we go back to verse 13, and we read the words of Jesus telling us to ask the Father to not lead us into temptation. And that, if we're honest, seems a little bit contradictory, doesn't it? Right? And if it didn't until now, my apologies. You're like, I had no issue with it until you said it. Now I'm thinking it, and you better fix it. All right. There wasn't a problem, and I made a problem where there wasn't one. All right. Wonderful. My life story. Let's fix it for you, though, okay? Um, so the question that we have this morning is how are we supposed to interpret this particular section of verse 13? How are we supposed to understand this so that we can apply it faithfully, right? Because before you can apply scripture, you have to understand the proper meaning of said scripture, correct? But we get a lot of problems. We just open the Bible like, I want to apply that to my life. And we do no due diligence in to understand it. Then we apply something stupid and we think God's going to rain gold dust on a conference and make us all wealthy and heal us of all of our diseases. Okay? We want to interpret it faithfully uh, so we can apply it faithfully. And the answer begins 
with looking at the original language, which I know you're all super excited to do. So stay with me because this is going to get a little bit nerdy and it's going to get a little bit heady and it's going to feel maybe a little bit like seminary-ish. Uh, but there is a reason why we do this, and I think it is important, okay? So um, <laughs> the earliest, once again, and most reliable ancient Greek manuscripts record this particular passage of verse 13 like this, okay? Told you it's going to get a little heavy, all right? Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing in Greek to you because I don't want to embarrass myself by my very poor uh, pronunciation of most of the Greek language. Uh, but this is what it looks like if you were to... Um, pull up a, uh, a, a Greek um, uh, translation or a Greek copy of this particular passage. It would be written in this structure. Now, what I've done for you here, and you can see, is next to each word, I put our English word for that. All right? And actually, if you read it this way, it almost reads identical. That's not always the case. Oftentimes, when you read Greek, uh, it switches certain verbs and nouns around in the subject, so it's not always structured like the English. But in this case, it, we're really pretty fortunate because when you read the Greek directly into English, okay, if you do a direct um, um, uh, word-for-word -word translation, it's almost identical. It says, and do not lead, okay, there's that word, as pharaoh, us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. Okay, so, I mean, this is pretty straightforward. Um, you don't find anything, if you look at the original structure of it, that would allow you to make an argument for what we have in front of us today being a poor translation. Um, you would really struggle to make any type of argument saying that there's unclear wording, okay? Which means that what you have in front of you in your English Bible, if you have one of the more um, uh, uh, common, reliable, faithful ones, like an ESV, NASB, um, uh, CSB, one of these particular ones, you're going to find that what you have in front of you today is probably the most accurate translation of what Jesus said. Now, granted, he spoke in Aramaic, it was recorded in Greek, but we trust uh, the original manuscripts, okay? So, the question then could be posed, all right, well, if we're really trying to make this less confusing, if we're trying to figure out how could this not be contradictory, like, there's got to be a problem with what we have in front of us. And, all right, Pastor Kevin, I see that the sentence itself is structured in a way that we can't argue with, but what if, what if the Greek words mean something other than the English words we choose to use? You get what I'm saying? Sometimes we can have a Greek word, and we say, well, this means butter, but in Greek it actually means wood. That, you know, that we might want to fix that, right? So we already showed that that first few words, um, lead us into, can only mean direct intentional action of bringing someone into something. So we, we know that that can't be wrong. And the only other word of any significance here that could possibly change anything is um, this word right here, which we've translated as temptation, is a Greek word that is pronounced uh, parasmo or parasmos. And we've called this word temptation, but the question is, could this possibly have another meaning that could all of a sudden change the whole way verse 13 reads, thus making it not seem difficult or contradictory and us being able to say, yes, see, God doesn't tempt because this actually doesn't mean temptation. We've just done a poor job translating it. Well, if we look at, and this is how you figure out what does this word really mean, well, look at every single instance in Scripture where this word was used. And if you do that, I'm not going to bore you with every single instance. I think it's, um, boy, I'm, I'm taking a shot in the dark. It's, it's either seven times or 21 times. I forget which one it was. I was looking at a couple different ones. Um, but every time it's used, the context always determines its meaning because this word itself, <clears throat> parasmos, can mean to tempt, or it can mean to prove or put through a trial. Okay. Well, that could change things, couldn't it? That could change things. Um, there is the option to interpret this word as a trial or test, which would have the verse read, do not lead us into trials or tests, but deliver us from the evil one. It's a possibility, so we have to consider that. Could that be a better understanding, which could change the whole thing, and it could clear up this problem of God possibly tempting? The, the problem here is we know that tests and trials 
are used by God according to Scripture, ordained by God, and arranged by God according to Scripture for our own personal edification and our own personal spiritual development. If you want proof of that, just go to James chapter 1, 2 through 4. And James writes this, Brother Jesus, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, it's that same word, prosmos, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So here's the deal, man. Trials or tests are good because they are tools that God uses to bring us, the Christian, into deeper Christian maturity, okay? So praying to not be tried Praying not to be tested, praying not to be led into these things is to pray against spiritual development. Amen? So there is no precedent. We can't do that. That would be more contradictory than anything. So no matter how deep we dig into the original text, no matter how much we dig into during word studies, lead us into temptation simply means lead us into temptation. It's an accurate translation, and it means what it means, yet some people still can't accept that. I'll give you a great example. Um, back in June of this year, uh, this guy that likes to wear women's dresses and, and uh, dress like a Sith Lord, just saying, he, he looks like uh, Palpatine when he has his hood up. Fun fact for you, um, he, this, this guy, the Pope, uh, made the news in June uh, because he officially changed the wording of the Bible. <laughs> Don't know how you do that. But he officially changed the wording of verse 13 in the Catholic Church, uh, which caused a lot of controversy in, in, in evangelical circles and even some, with some conservative Catholics. And he changed it from lead us not into temptation, which we've established clearly is the best translation, um, and he changed it to, do not let us fall into temptation, right? He changed that word as pharaoh from lead us into or bring us into to a more gentler, don't let us fall into temptation, right? And the Pope claimed that this was needed because the current English translation of the Greek was no good, and the current English translation of the Greek portrayed God in a bad light. Like, listen, God, you're, you didn't do yourself justice here. Let me, let me help you out. <laughs> like, you got to be pretty arrogant and be like, hey, hey, Big G, I got you. You kind of screwed this up. Let me, let me fix it for you. But he went on to say, and he was quoted as saying in an Italian newspaper, a father does not lead him to temptation. A father helps you get up immediately. It's not a good translation because it speaks of a God who induces temptation. Now, this is an absolutely stupid and false statement. Um, it's clear that the translation we have in front of us is the best translation of the original wording. Um, it's clear that what we have in front of us conveys the intended meaning. I think I, I, I've shown you that pretty well in a very quick word study. Um, here's the deal. This is true with most attempts uh, that people make to modify God's word, all right? When people do this, it's not based off of linguistic knowledge because obviously the Pope has no linguistic knowledge if he came to this conclusion. Um, but when people do this, they base us off of personal discomfort of what they believe a passage implies. That's why this happens. Um, we're seeing this happen in denominations all across the world right now, uh, especially in the Methodist denomination, as they're changing some of the language of the Bible to make it more politically correct and more accepting of different worldviews and different lifestyles. Uh, and this is never done, I want to say it again, based off of a linguistic knowledge, but it's always done off of personal discomfort of what they believe a passage implies. In this case, they believe the passage implies that God tempts. And they believe it contradicts other passages like James 1.13, which I read to you guys, or James 1.3, which says God does not tempt. Let no one say when he's tempted that it was God. Okay? Um, but here's the deal. Let's try to make this make sense to you guys. Okay? So I, 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 I've told you what the problem was. I've shown you how the scripture can't be twisted or changed that what we have is right in front of us. I've shown you how other people have had the same issues with it. They've attempted to, to change the word of God, um, even though the word of God says don't even change anything, not even one iota of scripture. So how do we look at this? Well, if you look at your verse 13 in front of you, you're going to see that Jesus is not asking us to pray that God would not tempt us. 
it's not all what he's, what he's telling us to pray for. Um, that obviously would be uh, nonsensical, right? It's not possible for God to do this. We're not asking God to not tempt us. Rather, we're asking that he would not lead us into temptation. So the implication should not be made that this is saying God tempts us. Rather, the scripture is implying that God is the one who sovereignly leads all things, that God is the one who sovereignly guides all things, that God is the one who ordains and who moves us through every aspect of our lives, and we are simply asking him, this is what it implies, that we are simply asking him to lead us or bring us away from situations that might tempt us to sin. Right? That's all it is. It's not implying a God who would tempt. It's implying a God who leads. It's implying a God who has sovereign control over all things. It's implying that God is in control of every situation. And it's implying that the person who is praying this recognizes God's sovereignty over all things and is simply submitting to said sovereignty and saying, God, lead us. Lead us away from anything that could cause us temptation. Um, that's what's implying. A high view of, man, of God and a low view of man. See, remember, we're sheep. We wander. We make poor choices. We have no defense against the minefield of temptation that's out there, right? Uh, not only can we absent-mindedly wander into temptation, which I think we all do sometimes. We're like, holy crap, how did I get here? Like, I was just minding my own business. Next thing I'm like, I'm, I'm knee-deep in sin. Amen. My life. My life. Okay. Done it. <laughs> how did I get here? And then someone, like, knocks you over your head. You're like, oh, that's embarrassing, right? So we can, we can absentmindedly wander into temptation, but often we will, according to our own free will, choose to seek out temptation because for some reason it seems more desirable than submission to God. All right? So what this is really doing is this is a request for an all-powerful, sovereign God to lead us away from influences, environments, or situations that might tempt us to sin. We recognize that he is the one who can lead us into anything. Everything is within his control. Right? We've talked about the sovereignty of God before. It's a hard thing for some people to grasp. We still have free will. We can choose to walk away from God. We can choose to rebel. We can choose to sin. But God is never not in control. He allows his children to rebel. He allows us to be foolish. He allows us to walk into sin. And this is a prayer of people that say, I don't want to do that. I want you to lead me. I want you, don't, don't lead me into these things. I recognize that you are fully in control of all things. And this is a prayer of someone who recognizes the magnificence and the all-powerfulness of God, the sovereignty of God, the inability of man, and is saying, Lord, lead me. Okay? Shepherd me. Pastor me. Um, this statement is followed by the words, but deliver us from the evil one. Okay, so by stating, but deliver us from the evil one, after what we just read, lead us not into temptation, Jesus is making clear that the temptation that we are asking the Father to lead us away from is a temptation that finds its origins in Satan, not the Father. All right? See, if this statement was implying, all right, if the statement was implying God as the one who tempts, it would have to say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from your hand. If it was implying that God tempts, it would have to say that. But it doesn't. What does it say? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So the statement itself cannot imply God tempting because it's very, making it very clear that it is the evil one who does the tempting. We are asking a sovereign father, a sovereign shepherd to protect us from being led into that temptation. We're saying, Lord, don't lead me there. Okay. Uh, so we're asking God to graciously lead us away from temptation lest our weak flesh causes us to rebel when we become tempted and then we fall into sin and sin is something that leads to death. All right. So now someone might be thinking, well, of course, God doesn't want to lead us into situations that might tempt us. And you might be thinking that. Kevin, this seems absolutely silly. Why even ask God to not lead us there? He obviously wants good things for us. He want, uh, we, we read passages like God takes no delight in sin. Uh, why even ask him to not lead us there? And I think that's a valid question. And if you have that, you're a smart cookie. Check this out. We ask God frequently to lead us into things like deeper holiness, do we not? 
We ask God to lead us into deeper righteousness. We ask the Father to lead us into deeper communion with him. Um, not only do we do that often, we're encouraged to. And we see no issue with that. But we could say the same thing about that. Well, Pastor Kevin, why pray for God to lead us into deeper righteousness, deeper holiness, deeper purity, deeper communion with him? Doesn't he already want that, right? Of course he does. Of course he wants that. He wants to lead us into things that are his will. Yet we find ourselves being told in Scripture to pray for those things, to pray for God to do just that. We are told time and time again in Scripture to pray, and even in this prayer itself, your will be done. We ask for God to be God. We ask for God to lead us and to keep us and to sustain us in all things good and bad. Right? Why is it such a weird thing to say, oh my gosh, why would we ask God not to lead us into temptation? He wouldn't do that anyways. Why ask God to lead us into deeper communion? Doesn't he want to do that? But we do it because we are people who recognize that we are being led by a shepherd and we want that shepherd to be in complete and total control. And we want God to be God. So we pray, God, be God. Be who you say you are. Do what you will over my life, in my life, and with my life. So we pray, lead us into holiness. Don't lead us into temptation. Now, I think another helpful thought to keep in mind as we seek to understand this passage is the greatest impact prayer has is not on God, rather the greatest impact prayer has is on us, okay? Let that just sink in for a second. Um, I, think we, I think this will help us understand this a little bit more, all right? I said earlier today as we were starting our offering that everything that we do in life is an act of worship. Well, it's no different with prayer. See, prayer is an act of worship. Um, prayer is an act whereby uh, we as creation commune with our creator, all right? Um, prayer is an act of, of worship. It's an act of unprecedented grace. Um, it's an act where we are ushered into the throne room of the Most High. Prayer is an act where we are welcomed into fellowship with the Father. And prayer is an act whereby which we get to experience the Lord's presence in a way that not even angels themselves are privy to. Um, prayer is incredible. And prayer is worship. All right? And while God has, according to his good pleasure, allowed his plan for the redemption of creation to be ushered in by the prayers of his people, it's still an act that benefits us more than it benefits him. Should I say that again? Do you guys say it again? All right. um, God has according to his own good pleasure, allowed, um, allowed us to take part in his plan for redemption of creation through our prayers, and, and for whatever reason, God takes pleasure in that, even though he is ushering these things in by the prayers of his people, it is still an act that benefits us way more than it benefits him. Okay. See, prayer helps shape Christians and mold believers into the image of Jesus. That's, that's what it does, all right? It helps shape us and it helps mold us. Think about this. Let me give you some great examples uh, from what we've been studying for the last couple months. Uh, when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, follow me here, we're reminded of our need to depend on him for all things. That's what daily bread is. And we're reminded of our need to be content with what we have. And that, my friends, it grows us, right? So when we pray, forgive us of our debts, we're reminded of our inability to save ourselves, we're reminded of his mercy, we're reminded of his grace, and that humbles us, right? Uh, when we pray as we forgive our debtors, we're reminded through the act of prayer, the spiritual act of worship, of our need to show that same mercy and that same grace to others, lest we live a life of hypocrisy and grieve the Holy Spirit. And what does that do? That challenges us, does it not? Right? And when we pray, lead us not into temptation, we are reminded very acutely of our need for utter dependency on him as the great shepherd and the importance of staying far away from influences or situations that desire to tempt us and that should convict us. Right? See, listen, church, and this is really important, okay? God is not informed by our prayers. Rather, we are transformed by them. Okay, let me say that again. God is not informed by our prayers. 
Rather, we are transformed by them. Okay? If anybody is sitting here today and you came in thinking that somehow um, our prayers inform God of situations or thoughts, like we are God's Fox News channel, like he's like, dude, I don't know what's going down on earth. I was really needing Jim to just pray and he didn't inform me of everything. Um, but we have the habit of doing that, do we not? Like when we pray, like, hey, God, it's, it's me, Kevin, from Jefferson. As if God's like, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin. Oh, from Jefferson, yeah, the, the one that destroyed his body with tattoos and treated it like a piece of artwork. Uh, but hey, listen, God, here's the deal, man. Uh, yesterday, my, my sister came to our house in, uh, and, and she said this to me. God's like, listen, I'm, I'm about 20,000 steps ahead of you, bro. We can, let's speed this up. Where are we going? Right? <laughs> Hey, God, I don't know if you know this, but this person is sick, and uh, um, uh, they were diagnosed yesterday, I think it was around 8 o'clock, Lord, and, and Father, I just would ask, like, listen, you, you're, not, you're not God's eyewitness news. He knows all things past, present, and future because he exists outside of time, so time has no constraints on him. He sees all of creation from beginning to end in, in one shot, one kill, okay? Are you with me? Up and down, north and south? Yes? You track it with me? There we go. Sophie, up and down, north and south. <laughs> Gotta love small churches. We can do stuff like that. <laughs> um, he's omniscient, which is to say he's all-knowing. Uh, he's not waiting for you to, to, to tell him what's happening. Uh, rather, God is graciously welcoming us into his perfect presence so that he cannot be informed, but rather that we can be transformed from the world and conformed to his will. Right? He's not looking to be informed. He's desiring us to be transformed and conformed to his will through the act of prayer. Okay? Prayer is worship. And prayer is something that we need to long for and discipline ourselves to do because prayer makes us look a lot more like Jesus. Sermons are great. Man, uh, one of the ways that God gives common grace to his people is through the preaching and teaching of his word. But I found oftentimes in my life it is through prayer that God really convicts me and moves me and breaks me. Which is why sometimes I don't like to pray. Because <laughs> I'm like, I'm good. You hurt. You've stopped on it enough this week. Can I just sprout a little bit? <clears throat> Praise God that he convicts those he loves, right? Bottom line is, we are coming to him in prayer, recognizing that the world is full of temptation. We are recognizing that we are prone to wander like sheep. We recognize we are unable to resist temptation on our own, and we are simply asking him, the one who controls all things, to lead us away from the things that would seek to tempt us. And we're doing this not because if we don't, he won't, but so that we can be daily reminded of our need to flee temptation and sin. Yes? Cool. All right. Let me move to our third section. That was our longest one. Um, but deliver us. This is my personal favorite. If you don't like this one, I don't care. This is my favorite part of the whole thing. Very short, very easy. Um, we address some of the difficulties, perceived difficulties, and the challenges, right? In these last couple sections, these last two, we look at some words, <coughs> like words. Uh, now we're looking at something that I think a lot of you might miss when you read this, okay? The third section, I think it hits like a sledgehammer. And the third section consists of uh, these three simple words, but deliver us, Okay? So our request for protection, which is a sixth component of faithful prayer, it begins with lead us, right? Lead us not. And it ends with what? Deliver us. And what do you notice is repeated in both of those same statements? The word us, right? Go back to verse 11. You're going to, say the same, you're going to see the same thing. It says, give us this day of daily bread. If you go to verse 12, you see the same thing again. And forgive us our debts. <laughs> Um, as we forgive our debtors. You can even go back to the very beginning in, in verse 9, and you're going to see that it says, our father, not my father or your father, okay? Um, even the opening appeal is plural. So time and time again, we see Jesus modeling this as a prayer. Check this out. This is where it just hit, it's going to just hit you hard. Your mind's going to explode. Jesus has given us a model for prayer that is not an individual prayer, for the individual, but it is a model 
for the believer to pray on behalf of a body, which is to say the local church. This is not to be done as an individual prayer. This is to be a corporate prayer. Whether it's prayed together in a group like we do in our evening services, or whether it is a model that we pray on our own on behalf of the body around us. Listen, uh, we need to pray for ourselves, amen? Like, if you're not doing that, you're just, you're just wrong, all right? Um, don't neglect that. But this prayer is not an individual prayer. It's, it's a corporate prayer, and we are supposed to be praying this on behalf of those whom we fellowship with. So the church um, comes from a Greek word called ecclesia, and that word does not actually correlate directly to church. Ecclesia means a gathering, a collective gathering of people, in this case, like-minded people. So an ecclesia can be looked at as a universal ecclesia, the universal global church, right? Which is why if you're not a, a believer in Christ, you're not part of the church, all right? You, you can't belong until you believe. And we make the mistake in the American church of letting people belong before they believe. And we're not doing any of you a service by doing that. Because we give false hope when we do that, okay? It's like a cinnamon roll scented candle when you wake up. You're like, sweet, cinnamon rolls. Crap, it's a candle, okay? Just, it's cruel, don't do it. Um, but this is to be prayed on behalf of the local body. It's to be prayed on behalf of the local church, Okay? And that's a game changer. See, it shifts the whole tone and the reason for praying. Like, when you understand that Jesus desires people, believers, to gather together in local groups or assemblies, ecclesias, right? When you understand that Christ desires us not just to gather together, but to know each other enough to pray faithfully for each other, to gather frequently enough to pray over each other, and to love each other enough to pray urgently, I think that changes things. I think that changes the whole way that you, that you uh, see this particular prayer. Like, you can't read this model for prayer and not be confronted with the truth that Jesus wants this to be a prayer, not just on your behalf, but on behalf of everyone in your local church. And until we see it that way, we're missing a massive component of this particular prayer. Okay? Uh, Hebrews 10, uh, 23 through 25 says this. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day, this is the day of the Lord, approaching. Okay. So the author of Hebrews says we should consider how to spur each other on towards love and good deeds. Like, that sounds great. Well, listen, guys. One of the simplest ways that you can spur each other on towards love and good deeds is by praying for each other. Right? By praying for each other's holiness, um, by praying for each other's faithfulness, by praying for each other's purity, uh, by praying for each other to be led away from temptation, and praying for each other to be delivered from evil. See, there's a reason why Jesus taught them to pray us and our, not me and mine. Okay? Um, church, there's a very real need we all have here to be prayed over, and there's a very real responsibility that the Christian has to contribute to those prayers. So here's the deal, man. This is, uh, if this convicts, let it convict. And if this hurts, let it hurt. Um, if you're a member of Forge Church, but you're not praying for the people of Forge Church, then you need to repent and get your prayer life in order because it's not faithful. Okay? Just let that sink in. Because that's something that I have to ask myself too. I can't get in the habit of not praying for you. If I'm doing that, I'm not a faithful member of this church. If you're a member of Forge Church, but you're not praying for the people of Forge Church, like this model says, then get in line with this model really quick because this is not a us, uh, this is not a me and mine prayer, this is a us and this is an our prayer, okay? Um, and if we fail to participate in this act by either separating from the body and trying to live as believers apart from a local church, um, or if we neglect others in our personal prayer time, I want to tell you we're missing out on one of the ways God delivers his people from temptation, the evil one. Because one of the ways that God delivers his people and protects his people is through the prayers of the church. It's a beautiful thing. It's why we take this seriously, and that's why we're gathering tonight, to be able to pray for you guys. We love doing that. It's a privilege. It's a responsibility. So let's look at this last component, or I shouldn't say last component, this last section of verse 13 this morning, uh, which says, from the evil one. All right. Now, 
This last part makes some people uncomfortable, as did that first part, but for very different reasons. Okay? Um, and this is a part that does get changed from time to time. The original wording here that I showed you when I gave you the full uh, Greek text, it says, deliver us from the evil. Okay? Um, it doesn't say deliver us from evil. It says deliver us from the evil. If you have a translation in front of you this morning that says deliver us from evil, I'm going to tell you that that's probably not the best translation of this particular text. Um, the original wording has a particular Greek article that's pronounced ha that precedes the word evil. And that article we, we translate as, as the. And that, that Greek article ha personifies the word evil that, that comes after it. Okay? Um, so we must look at the word evil as not just some impersonal, ambiguous evil, but as a very real, very <clears throat> personal evil, which is why faithful translations record this as the evil one. Right? They are recognizing that this is evil personified. It's not just ambiguous evil. Now that might seem to be not that might seem like it's nothing to be uncomfortable about, um, but many Christians get very uneasy speaking about or teaching about Satan um, as if believing in him um, or his existence and recognizing his work against creation somehow makes them seem less intelligent in conversations. Um, it makes the words less respectable, less credible, or possibly it gives the enemy more credit than he's due. So to soften this prayer, they change the language by dropping out the ha and just making it this ambiguous protection from evil. Now, church, listen close. Uh, there is no such thing, there's no such thing um, as just random evil. Okay? There's no such thing as good vibes and bad vibes. All right? Um, that just kind of float around out there moving on people like waves on a beach, all right? Evil has an actual source, and the source of all evil is Satan. You can call him Lucifer. You can call him the devil. You can call him the god of this world. You can call him the prince of the power of the air. You can call him the tempter. You can call him the ancient serpent. Those are all titles that he is given in Scripture. Uh, regardless of whatever you want to call him, you cannot separate evil from him, period. And if you intend to teach faithfully, if you intend to learn accurately, if you desire to navigate temptation successfully, you have to recognize his very real presence and his very real work. And I would say as well as that of his co-laborers, which are the angels who fell with him when he rebelled against the Father in heaven. And... Uh, desire to be like him. Right? Now the other error Christians have in speaking or teaching about evil is to do the exact opposite, which is to overplay the role, as opposed to just diminish it, because we don't want to talk about it, because it might make us seem ho hokey and crazy. right? Um, the opposite is they overplay the role of Satan, and they overplay the role of his forces on creation. And uh, you might have met some of these people, and they're very weird. Uh, they go so far as to attributing every single sin, every struggle, and every obstacle to Satan that happens to him throughout their day. Again, I've met these people. They're, they're hilarious. Um, and I would like them not to tell anybody that they are a Christian because they make us seem weird. Um, but they're the ones that are like, hey, they spill their coffee in the morning and they get to work. They're like, Satan tried to stop me this morning. Not going to let him. Not today, Satan. Right? <laughs> they get into a tra you ever met that person, right? They get into a traffic jam and they rebuke the traffic jam in the name of Jesus because the traffic jam is the work of Satan. And you're like, no, it's because the teenager was on her cell phone taking selfies and she crashed on the belt line. This is, no, it's not Satan. Okay. Um, but they overplay the role of Satan. So we don't want to underplay his role by eliminating it and making evil some ambiguous thing, but we also don't want to overplay his role either. Um, C.S. Lewis, in one of his famous books called The Screwtape Letters, he wrote this, and I think this is a great way to sum it up. He says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. Both they delight in. So as Christians, we often err on the side of either denial or obsession when it comes to spiritual warfare. And both are dangerous. Okay? Both are very dangerous. Okay? Uh, here's the deal, church. Let's, just, uh, let, let's try to get a, a, good, um, a good faithful understanding. First off, we have to understand Satan has real power. 
He has real authority. 1 Peter 5, 8 uh, um, recognizes, says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. <coughs> now, Peter isn't saying that, that Satan's a lion. Like, I thought that was a title reserved for Jesus, you know, the lion of Judah. He's not saying he's a lion. He's saying that rather he roams around the earth stalking and hunting for the weak and the unprotected like a lion would. Right? Okay? Um, and personally, I love that word picture because once you see the enemy like that and you pair this with what we taught earlier, the fact that God calls us sheep, we want him to be our shepherd, it really helps us recognize the dangers we're all in uh, when we stray away from the protection of God's leading. When you recognize it, you're like, oh, I'm like a 150 to 200 pound like meat stick. And if I'm not careful, I'm just going to get, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be lunch. Okay? Um, we have no defenses against a well equipped predator unless we cling to the good shepherd. Um, and this is why he urges us to come to him fervently and, and frequently, and in this case daily, for protection. Um, and we can have confidence that while God, uh, I shouldn't say, let me say that again. We, ha we should have um, a good, healthy understanding that even though Satan is powerful, even though he has real authority and he has real strength um, and he has, he has a real ability to, uh, to torment, uh, to tempt, we need to understand very clearly that the ultimate power and the ultimate authority is in the Father and the Father alone. And, and 1 John 4, 4 says that. It says, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So my friends, only God is all-knowing, all right? We get this really weird. Again, this is that overplay the role of Satan. Some people think, I got to, uh, this is really terrible. You see this in the charismatic churches. Everybody has to speak in tongues, and that should be your private prayer language. Because if you speak in regular words, Satan can hear them in your head. And then he knows them. So you have to speak in this, in this, in this tongues in your private prayer. You guys are looking at me all weird. Trust me, there's many churches that, that teach this. Listen, he's not all-knowing. Right? He's not everywhere. He's not omnipresent. God is all-knowing. God is all-present. God is all-powerful. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. Very simple, all right? Only he can give us complete protection, which he's modeled here. So we don't rely and run the self-help books for deliverance. We don't look inside of ourselves for strength. That's stupid, all right? I don't like that. That's a new movement. Everybody wants self-empowerment. Your self-empowerment is absolutely ridiculous, okay? Um, there's no strength to be found inside of yourself. Uh, we don't rely on the world around us for hope. Uh, they will let us down. Rather, we are told to go to the only source that has the ability to protect us, and that is the Father, and we do that through the act of faithful, submissive prayer. Lord, you lead us. Because I don't trust myself. Amen? Um, I want to close by saying this. Uh, <clears throat> if your hope in overcoming temptation is that it's going to eventually stop someday, if that's your plan... Someday this is going to stop. I failed, but it's okay. It's going to wait long enough. Eventually the temptation isn't going to be there anymore. Um, it pains me to tell you that that is not going to happen. Okay? Um, Jesus tells his disciples in this prayer that we are to ask for daily protection from temptation. Right? It's give us this day our daily bread. And that daily should be able to be transposed to all those other petitions. Um, he tells them, ask for daily protection from the temptation because he rightly understands that temptation will not stop until the day that your heart stops. Okay? It's just that's, that's the truth. Now, listen, guys. A particular temptation might diminish. I get that. A particular temptation that you're fighting might eventually go away over time, but in its place, I promise you that you will find another one. Okay? Um, this world has no end to the temptations that it offers, and our flesh has no limits to what it craves. We will always find a new temptation. Uh, the only hope for creation is to find deliverance through submitting itself to the leading of a caring and protective creator. And, and that's just the truth. So if you can say today with confidence that Christ is not simply your Savior, but he's also your Lord who leads you, um, if you can say with confidence today that you have willingly come under um, his lordship, his saving grace, um, then here's your hope. All right? If that's you today, here's your hope. 
though you may get wounded as you go about a life of service to Christ, for those of you who can affirm that, you will eventually find rest and peace in eternity with a sweet Savior who will lovingly lead you and keep you despite the best efforts of the evil one. All right? that's, your, that's your promise. That's your hope. Um, but if you can't confidently say that today, if you can't confidently say that Jesus is your Lord, um, if you can't state that you've been saved by his grace alone, through faith alone, not through baptism, not through a church membership, not through a confirmation, um, if you cannot say that you've been saved by simply your faith, then not only will this world wound you, but this world will absolutely, positively destroy you. Okay? Um, if that's you this morning, I want to tell you, you are going to be like a ship anchored too close to a shore during a storm. You will be beaten up against the rocks until all that remains at the end of your life is a broken hull. I want to tell you, and I promise you, you will find no hope or defense against temptation. And if you might be, and you may be oblivious to the damages now, but the day will come where the damages will become quite apparent and abundantly clear. Um, I promise you, my friend, your life will end in destruction and ruin as temptation will have led to sin in your life and sin will have led to death and death will have claimed you with no hope of deliverance. And if that is you today, and if you can, by God's grace, hear his call to salvation, then I implore you and I urge you and I beg you and I beseech you to respond to it immediately and don't delay. I implore you to run to the cross and not consider it anymore. And take the fact that you can be convicted as an act of grace and his love and his pursuit of you. Run, don't walk, my friend. Repent and believe so you can have eternal life. That you can be anchored far away from the shore. So that you can be anchored to something that will hold you firm and protect you. Because you will not get through this life unscathed. Temptation has a 100% mortality rate. And it is no respecter of person, income, race, creed, or even religious affiliation. I want to give you all a moment to consider this before we close in prayer. And let's take uh, about a minute to reflect on uh, what God has spoken to our hearts this morning. <coughs> Thank you so much uh, for being a God whose character is unchanging. Thank you for being a God whose nature is firm, steadfast, reliable, knowable. Lord, I thank you that nothing in your word is contradictory. There's nothing in your perfect word that is at odds with each other. Uh, Father, thank you for giving us the ability to know your word to have minds that can understand it, that can comprehend it, and forgive us for the times that we have in our own arrogance and our own ignorance with pride and haughtiness sought to change your word to fit our, 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 our preconceived notions of who we think you are. Uh, Father, forgive us for the times that we have ignored your word when it's been difficult to take in. Father, uh, continue to mold our hearts to your will in areas that we want to rebel and reject. Uh, Father, lovingly convict us and correct us. Lord, I, I, I thank you uh, for the knowledge that we are frail, weak, that we are defenseless, 
and that we have a complete inability to defend ourselves. Thank you for helping us to be able to recognize that because it's only in that that we can cling to you and recognize that uh, only you are our strength. So, Father, we ask that you would be our strength, that you would be the one who, res who, who helps us resist the temptation that is out there. Father, lead us not into it. Deliver us from it. Um, <clears throat> Lord, convict us this morning, whether, the, whether we need more accountability from other men and women in our lives, whether we need more transparency, whatever it might be, Father, help us to seek out those things that would keep us from these, these dark areas in our heart that uh, we hide our sin. Lord, I thank you that um, you continue to work through an inadequate uh, uh, speaker. I thank you that you have saved a wretch like me. And um, Lord, I would ask that... Uh, if anyone sees anything good come out of me, that it would just constantly lend them to magnify and glorify you more. Um, because, Father, there is nothing good in me. I'm thankful for the privilege of leading this church. Thank you for the people who constantly love me and care for me. Um, thank you for their patience with me. Thank you for letting them um, be led by, by me. It's, uh, it, it is just absolutely amazing. Um, Father, help them to know how much uh, they are loved here. And Lord, uh, continue to shape me into a better pastor, a better leader for them. Um, Lord, grow this church as you see fit. Grow these people as you see fit. I would ask that this would be a church of deep disciples, not shallow gatherings or a large mass of people who don't know you. Uh, we love you very much. We look forward to see how you will continue to shape us um, as we meet throughout this week and discuss your word and its applications in our lives. Uh, Father, thank you for this time. We ask all this in Christ's name.